What is it that brought these young men into radical Islam? If you go back to Saadeddin's study in the 70s, he found that most of these young men, and there are still to this day all young men in Al-Qaeda, most of them were students who were away from the homes in the first time. They were from the villages and the rural areas of Egypt, and they were streaming into these massive universities in Egypt, in Cairo, in Alexandria, in Mansour. They were away from their families. And radical Islam offered them companionship, the solace of friends and their religion. Sageman found very much the same thing. The most common factor among all the young men that he studied who joined Al-Qaeda, 90% of them joined the Jihad in a country other than the one in which they were reared. They were away from home. Now, Sageman called this phenomenon displacement. It's just as true for a Pakistani in the UK as it is for a Yemeni laborer in Saudi Arabia. What we had in common was the fact that they were out of their home country. Now I'm going to distinguish a little bit between radicalism in the West and radicalism in the Muslim and Arab worlds. The results may be similar, but I think the causes are very different. Let's look at the recent plots in the UK. Uh, the airplane plot, for instance, or the subway bombing, the 777 subway bombing. These are not first generation immigrants. These are not kids who are away from their home for the first time. They're second and third generation British citizens. So I don't think that the term displacement serves us well anymore. I think a better word for this is marginality. I'm speaking of this sense of uh, lack of attachment to the culture that one is reared in. I think this reflects a genuine failure of many European societies to integrate their Muslim minorities. Let's look at the situation in the UK, which is where I think the, the most acute right now. Uh, MI6 and MI5 say they've been following 2,000 different radicals in 200 different networks. And there are more than 100 people in, in Great Britain right now awaiting trial on terrorism charges. Now, it's my feeling that these young men feel neither authentically British nor Pakistani. It's not really a clash of civilizations, I think, so much as a clash of identities within the civilization. Take the example, for instance, of Belgium. The number one name for a child born in Belgium today is Mohammed. Now, it's not that surprising. Mohammed is the most common given name in the whole world right now. But let's say you're of Flemish ancestry. No doubt you're wondering, where is this going? What's going to happen to my country's precious little place in the world? our history, our language, our sense of who we are as a people. And if you're Muhammad, probably you're saying to yourself, these people don't want me. I'll never be one of them. And it's likely that Muhammad doesn't speak Arabic. It's likely that he's never even been to Morocco. He's lost. There's practically no one in the world as lost as he is. So it's not surprising that he would go to the mosque and find other angry, alienated young men just like him. And that the imam of that mosque would minister to those feelings of alienation and marginality. And that for them, Islam would become more than a religion. It would become an identity. I'm going to speak for a moment just about the situation in the United States, which is so different in interesting ways. I mean, we're very blessed with our Arab and Muslim populations. The average American Muslim makes about the same wage as the average American, is as likely as the average American to go to college or graduate school. 
is far less likely than the average American to go to prison. Compare that situation to France, for instance, where you have about 12% of the population is Muslim. 60% of the prisoners are. What a stark measure, the degree of marginality those people feel. That doesn't mean that we're immune in America. A 2007 Pew poll of Muslim attitudes in America found that 58% of American Muslims strongly disapproved of Al-Qaeda. Doesn't seem like much, it's a much higher figure than you find in Europe. But still, of American Muslims, 5% had a favorable view. Now in a population of perhaps two and a half million people, that's 125,000 highly radicalized people. I think that's enough to support a homegrown movement in the United States should it arise. By far the highest percentage of American Muslims who expressed favorable views of Al-Qaeda were African American Muslims who historically have little or no tie to the Middle East but have a historic sense of grievance and a feeling of marginality. Only 36% of them expressed an unfavorable view of Al-Qaeda. Now some of you who are students of the, the speeches of, of bin Laden or his secretary, his, his assistant, Ivan Nelson Walker, may have noticed in recently in the last year or two, they've been cultivating this group. They frequently uh, invoke the name of Malcolm X, for instance. <coughs> Uh, I think they're deliberately trying to seek recruits from the African-American Muslim community. There was a report by the New York Police Department on radicalization in the West, and it concluded, the transformation of a Western-based individual to a terrorist is not triggered by oppression, suffering, revenge, or desperation. Rather, it is a phenomenon that occurs because the individual is looking for an identity and a cause, and unfortunately often finds them in extremist Islam. Now, the situation is different in the Arab and Muslim worlds. Let's, let's hear oppression, suffering, uh, desperation. These really are causes for radicalization. Let's take, for instance, the Arab world. The Arab world reaches from Morocco to Indonesia. Um, it's, I mean, excuse me, to the Persian Gulf. It's larger than the United States. There are 300 million Arabs, about the same number as there are Americans. Now, if you were to take oil out of the Arab economies, and only a few of the 22 Arab countries produce an appreciable amount of oil. Those 300 million Arabs produce less for export than the 5 million Finns. Essentially less than the Nokia telephone company, which is the main export of Finland. This is the little Nokia that I carried around when I was in Saudi Arabia and now whenever I travel, but you know, the Saudis wouldn't let me in as a reporter. Uh, after 9-11, for a year and five months, I kept making application for visas and so on, and they kept stalling me, and I finally realized I was never going to get in as a reporter. So I took a job. I became an expat worker. I got a job um, uh, mentoring young reporters at the Saudi Gazette in, in Jeddah, which is Osama bin Laden's hometown. Uh, and it was the best piece of bad luck because instead of being a reporter in a hotel room making calls and so on, I had a, I had a flat, I had a car, I had a job I had to go to every day and I had all these wonderful young Saudi reporters teaching me far more about their country than I could ever have learned as a, as a reporter. But I often reflected while I was in Saudi Arabia that this one product outweighs the industrial output of the entire Arab world. Now, put oil back into those Arab economies, those 22 countries. The gross national product is still less than that of California. 